bring me the proof and I'm going to get on our member and other manabir throughout this country and we're going to encourage the people to do the mode of the nebawi because it, it's been established with Dalil. But until a person can do that, kalla wallahi, we're against it and it is an innovation and it should be avoided. So what I'm going to do today, inshallah, is I'm going to deal with some of the main proofs that the people use. Ayat of the Quran out of context. A hadith of the Prophet wasallam out of context. A hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam that are not authentic. Dreams that people have had that are used as delil. Before I do that though, inshallah, I just want to give you a historical background of the Mawlid and Nebawi. And I see many faces of young people who are here. Our elders from our grandmothers and grandfathers, great grandmothers and great grandfathers, they used to buy into these types of issues because the imams and people who taught them, our relatives, the older people, they didn't know how to read and write many times. But today, we don't have that excuse. With the explosion of knowledge on the internet, so much information is out there. Don't be a person who doesn't use your intellect. Allah has given us an intellect. So I want to ask the Ummah of Al-Islam, where is our intellect in regards to this historical fact? For the first 300 years in Al-Islam, 300, 300, the first 300 years that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked, who's the best of this Ummah, Ya Rasulullah? He told the people, the best of this Ummah are the people that I was sent to, Abu Bakr and Uthman, the first 100 years. And then after them, the second 100 years. And then after them, the third 100 years. So those three centuries, 300 years, are the best years in El Islam. They are the best years. Those are the years in which the awliya of Allah were plentiful. The ulama of El Islam were plentiful. The people of taqwa were plentiful. For over 300 years, you didn't find the Muslims anywhere in the Muslim world, anywhere. You didn't find a grave that was being worshipped along with Allah for 300 years. You didn't find a mausoleum built over a dead person or a saint for 300 years. The Prophet's grave, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was his grave, but the people did not make it their niyyat to go to that grave to worship it for 300 years. Likewise, for over 300 years, no one in the Muslim empire did the Mawlid the Nabawi, not a single person, for over 300 years. This issue was introduced to this Ummah in the fourth century, and it was introduced by the Fatimiyun. The Fatimiyun are a group of Shiite who curse Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, who believe that the Quran is incomplete, who said that Aisha radiallahu anha is a zaniya, all of those things that they believe, they have ilhad. These are the people who gave us the Mawlid and Nabawi. Just to give you an idea of who these people are, who they are. In the ninth century, these people, they came from Egypt. They went to Mecca and they made the blood of the Muslims halal at the Kaaba. They started decimating and killing Muslims at the Kaaba. They started taking the women and raping the women and killing the women and the children at the Kaaba. If you were a free person, they caught you, you became a slave. If they didn't kill you, they took you back to Egypt with them. They didn't stop there. These Fatimiyun, the dead bodies of the Muslims who they killed, they picked their bodies up and they threw them in the well of Zamzam, in the well of Zamzam, out of all of the places. It goes to show the nature of that individual. The Arabs have a, sta a statement if you want to become famous, urinate in the water of Zamzam. Because everyone's going to say, oh, that guy urinated in Zamzam. Because it's well known, if anyone does a sacrilegious act like that, he has no deen, no taqwa. But he'll become famous for the wrong reason. The point is, every Muslim loves Zamzam. They threw the dead bodies in the Zamzam well. They didn't stop there. They went to the Kaaba, and they took the black stone off of the Kaaba, and they went with it back to Egypt. They took the Muslims who were living in Mecca as slaves back to Egypt, those who they didn't kill, and they took with them the black stone. Now, I'm not a worshiper of 
the personality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I'm definitely not a worshiper of a stone, the black stone, we don't worship it as Umar said radiallahu anhu. I know that you're just a rock, you can't help me, you can't harm me. But I saw the Prophet kiss you, if I didn't see that then I wouldn't kiss you. But still the black stone is a symbol of our religion, it's a symbol of our religion. It came from the heavens, it came down. The Prophet said it was white as the driven snow. But when the people touched it and kissed it, it became black because it's a kafara. It takes off the sins of the people who touch it correctly. They took the black stone for 20 years. These are the people who gave us the mole, the nebawi. Where is the intellect of the ummah of al-Islam? Where is the intellect? Someone comes to me. Someone enslaved me, my grandfather, my forefathers took me from the country I came from, changed everything about who I am and how I live, what I believe in. And then he's going to give me a gift and I'm going to accept it. I'm going to look at him as an enemy, as if he is crazy. He has to give me something for me to take that's indisputable. He gives me a glass of water, I'll take it because I need it. But I'm not going to take anyone, anything from my enemy. Especially when that enemy is an enemy in religion, in the deen. What I believe in, what he believes is diametrically opposed. Those are the people who gave us the molded and nebo. Curses of Abu Bakr and Umar. After that, they did the molded and nebo. The Muslims did the molded and nebo for about 80 years, 85 years. And then a group of people called the Ayubiyun. They took over. They defeated the Fatimiyin and they took over. The Ayyubiyun stopped the Mawlid and Nabawi. In the 5th century, after 500 years, they stopped the Mawlid and Nabawi. Because the ulama said, this is not from Al-Islam, and they were in control, so they didn't let it happen. For over 200 years, there was no Mawlid and Nabawi. Over 200 years, there was no Mawlid and Nabawi. Started in 400, it was stopped at 500, it started again in the 7th century. In the 7th century, it was reinstated by a king during that time, the king of Irbil. His name was Mudaffir Kawkaburi. This man, as Al-Imam Al-Suyuti mentioned, he mentioned about what he did. He cooked for the people 5,000 roasted lambs. He cooked for the people 10,000 chickens. He gave the people 10,000 bowls of cream. He gave the people 30,000 bowls of, free, of sweet dishes. He gave the people who made poetry. If you made a nice line of poetry for the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaking about him, he will give you 1,000 gold dinars. And then Muslims started to do this all over the Muslim world in different shape, forms and fashions. As you can see here in the city of Birmingham, where the people, they look at the Mawlid the Nabawi as an Eid. They put more energy in the Mawlid and Nabawi than they do for Friday. Friday is a legislated Eid. It's our weekly Eid. Something you're supposed to do a lot of things concerning it. You're supposed to wear nice clothes. You're supposed to smell nice. Certain things you do. Some of the people put more emphasis on the Mawlid and Nabawi or just as much like the Eid al-Adha and the Eid al-Fitr. But when you ask them, where does it come from? They don't even know it came from the Fatimiyin. So that's the historical backdrop of the Mawlid and Nebawi. If we were to stop right here and we were to get up and we were to leave, I would think a person who didn't know would go back and research what I said. And look what Al-Imam Al-Suyuti said in his book Al-Hawi, Al-Imam Ibn Kathir and Bidaya wa Nihaya. Someone goes and he finds this historically. He says, man, that's enough for me. Someone who hated Abu Bakr Umar Uthman said that Aisha was this, the Quran is incomplete, the Mahdi is going to do this and do that. I'm not taking anything from those people. And that's why they celebrate the Mawlid al Nabawi on the 17th day of Rabi al Awwal. Sunnis on the 12th of Rabi al Awwal, and they on the 17th. Not to mention how. Allah Azawajal, Ikhwani, He has not allowed Bani Adam at this point to know the birthday of any Nabi. We don't know the birthday of any Nabi. And that is from the wisdom of Allah Azawajal. He knows that his servants have the propensity of going overboard. That shirk was introduced to the people because we go overboard in personalities. So from the scholars are those who say that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born on different days in Rabi'il Awl. Different days. 
Others say he was born in Muharram. Others say that he was born in Ramadan. Other ulama said he was born in Rajab. Others say we don't know. All we know is he was born on Monday or Thursday. That's all we know. We know that he was born in the year of the elephant. That's all we know. Like Musa. We knew that when Musa was born and he was young, just an infant. We know that he was in Egypt. We know that his mother put him in the basket in the water and it went down the river. We know that. Isa ibn Maryam. We knew that he's a Hebrew. We knew that he was born without a father. But what day he was born? No one knows these issues. No one knows these issues. After dealing with that...